This is episode 45 of the Music Therapy Chronicles podcast with Lori Kubacek. When I'm walking into the, into the room of a pediatric patient that's never met me, um, I've got two primary tools. One is myself, and then one is my crate full of awesome stuff. Um, and I always make sure that when a kid is singing for the first time at the door, they can see that I have a guitar in my back and I have this crate of stuff. And sometimes the crate is all they need and it's like, just come in, I want to I wanna see that stuff and kind of really get right into it. But sometimes they're not ready, but the crate isn't enough. So then it requires me to really work with what is probably presenting as some resistance or just uncertainty or terror or shyness. You know, it's it's all different levels. You're listening to the Music Therapy Chronicles, a podcast about music therapy from a variety of perspectives. Our ambition is to inspire and connect listeners through meaningful conversations, just like a music therapy conference you can listen to anywhere. My name is Trisha Coyote, and I am a board-certified music therapist from the New England region. If you like what you hear, join our group on Facebook and share your own insights and thoughts about the episodes. You can also connect with us on social media and online at Music Therapy Chronicles. back to the Music Therapy Chronicles podcast. In today's episode, we have my conversation with Lori Kubacek, who is a music therapist at the Massachusetts General Hospital, as well as the practicum and internship supervisor at that site. You may remember that Stephanie Lovell mentioned some of Lori's influential teachings in her episode, and we dive into those a little deeper in this episode, as well as lots of really practical tools for instruments and soundscape and other advice to keep in mind if you are working in any setting, but specifically a medical setting. If you are enjoying the podcast, please let us know by leaving a review on iTunes, Apple Podcasts. And if you haven't already, join our group on Facebook because our 50th episode is rapidly approaching and I want to give back. So in the Facebook group, I will be posting a poll for what you want to see for the 50th episode. Some ideas I have are highlights from the past episodes, um, a Where Are They Now series where we talk to guests again or just a rerun of some of your favorites, uh, someone specific you want us to reach out to, anything like that. Any ideas you have for what you want to see for the 50th episode, there will be a poll in the Facebook group. So join the group so you can put your vote in there. Something else you want to see or another idea you have to celebrate, then also add that. And just anytime, if there's someone you want me to reach out to or something specific you want to see on the show, uh, then let me know. Reach out. You can email me at feedback at musictherapychronicles.com. So without further ado, let's get into this episode. Welcome to the Music Therapy Chronicles. Thank you very much. How are you today? I'm doing very well. It's a beautiful, sunny Sunday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the weather's getting warm, which lately means that it'll get pretty cold again in a couple weeks, right? Yes, of course. (laughs) (laughs) So to start us off, can you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself outside of music therapy? Sure. Um, I am a a gardener. I love to cook. And I have recently started to learn how to quilt. And it's like the funnest thing ever. So I'm very kind of crafty and into kind of working with color in all sorts of different ways, food, flowers, material. (laughs) Good for you. I like that. Do you, what's your favorite thing to quilt so far, like big blankets or smaller projects? Well, I've um, quilted one thing. So, so far, that's my favorite thing because it's the only thing. (laughs) 
but I'm going to be working on a bigger project in March. So that's kind of exciting. So I'm just, I'm a baby quilter. I'm just learning. Awesome. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so can you walk us through your music therapy journey, how you found out about mm. music therapy, decided it was for you, your trajectory? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when I was a kid, I always, music was a part of everything that I did. I sang, I played saxophone and flute in the band. Um, and then as I grew a little older, I always knew that I wanted to use music to help people. But I thought that meant that I had to be a band director. And that did not make sense to me. No offense to all the band directors out there. Um, but it just didn't, it didn't really fit. And then when I was 17, I went to a career fair at like the local high school something. And I, there was a, a booth on music therapy. Um, and I was like, what is this? And I saw a little pamphlet that had a, um, you know, a bunch of elders like playing tambourines. And I was like, okay, this, this makes a lot of sense to me. Like it's using music to help people. It's a thing. So I, um, used that as, um, content for like applying for scholarships when I was going to school and I got a bunch of scholarships. So I was like, okay, well now I actually have to go study it. <laughs> so I, I took a year of music therapy courses in University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire, and it was a beautiful school. I loved it. Um, and then I went to Paul Newman's camp for kids with cancer and blood diseases in Connecticut called the Hole in the Wall Game Camp. And I met my first kid who was sick. And I was 19 years old at the time, and everything clicked for me. And I was like, okay, this is what I want to do, and this is who I want to do it with. So every uh, school year, I'd go to school in Eau Claire, and in the summer, I would drive out to Connecticut. I would have this crazy, awesome summer camp experience with all these kids, and I directed the theater at the time. Oh, cool. um, and then by the time I finished my internship, m one of my very first jobs was in a medical setting, So, and I've been there ever since. Awesome. So you knew really early on. I, I did. Yeah, exactly where you wanted to be. What did that feel like? Well, I never knew anything different, so it just felt like I was – being guided to do what kind of combined all of my passions and skill sets at the same time. So it was almost like I didn't have much of a choice in the matter <laughs> and I didn't want to have, I didn't want to choose differently. It just all made sense. And it kept kind of leading me down the same path to working with kids when they were at their most vulnerable um, in the hospitals. Yeah. And that's a really intense setting. Hmm. It is. It's, I mean, it's, it's intense, but it's also intensely joyful. So it's, it's all flavors of intensity. Um, and if you have the right kind of support system, the right kind of team, the right kind of environment and the right kind of self care practice, um, it's like the perfect kind of intensity, at least for me, it's definitely not for everybody. Yeah. So let's break those down. Let's start with mm -hmm. your, your team. Because when you started mm. out where you are, it was you, it was pretty minimal work. So yep. walk us through that growth. Yeah. Um, well, let's see that this started 16 years ago. Um, and I started actually through a collaboration with Berkeley College of Music as one of their practicum supervisors. And um, I was able to work like, first it was like an hour and a half you know, for a semester. And it, it seemed to work and people were like, oh, this is great. Um, but the hospital didn't love that I only came when there was Berkeley students. So they quickly found a tiny baby grant so that I could be there six hours a week. And then that grew to 15 hours a week. And then um, maybe a year later, the Mass General Cancer Center kind of got wind of what I was doing on inpatient pediatrics. And they said, well, we want some of that. So then I was there 20 hours a week. Um, and I was all over the place, inpatient and outpatient pediatrics, inpatient and outpatient adult oncology. And I did a group on the inpatient psych unit. So it just kind of kept growing. And then I was able to hire my first person to take over the adult work so that I could focus on pediatrics. And then there was two of us. And then it 
it again kept growing and I needed to find someone to take over my inpatient pediatric work because I was then moving into um, outpatient pediatrics. And so I added another person and then I was finally able to now I've got there's four of us. So I've got one 40 hour person that just does adult. Um, I have two different kind of part time ish um, staff members that do pediatrics and then the one is kind of a floater she does both and then there's myself so it's been really awesome to see it grow from this tiny baby practicum site for Berkeley into this uh, program that now has uh, over 120 hours of clinical music therapy around the hospital wow that's yeah, awesome so that's, it's cool yeah especially that you got the support early on that they just acknowledged what you were doing and wanted to fund that in whatever right. way they could. And that was that was a part of my choice making process in the beginning because this wasn't the only site that wanted me to be a music therapist in their medical setting. So I had to compare two different um, medical settings to see which environment was best was a be- was the best matched for me. And um, MGH really was the best match for me because there was never a door that was closed to music therapy. They're like, oh, you want to go in the PICU? Let's send you into pediatric intensive care. Do you want to go into, you know, outpatient radiation? Okay, let's, let's try it and see what happens. And that was, that still is really amazing to this day. Wow. Yeah. Do you still have practicum students coming through? I do. I actually have eight practicum students and two interns. Um, And we're even going to be expanding our internship program pretty soon into Leslie University. This is like fresh off the presses. You're awesome. hearing it first. <laughs> so we're going to start taking first year um, graduate students in the fall. So it's the, the education component is a really big part of who we are now because it's been a part of who, you know, we've been since the very beginning. And I'm really proud of our clinical education program. Yeah. So that's a lot for you to take on. Um, mm. Yeah. As and becoming this educator as well as this clinician with your your niche. So how do you how did you like blossom into this educator? Um, mm. I'll give you listen to Stephanie Levels episode and she mentioned did. you. Yeah. Oh. And leading with your voice. And I thought, well, right. when I talk to her, we're definitely going <laughs> to dive into that. But we can go broader first. So sure. Yeah. Being an educator. Um, so I, I've always loved teaching. It, that's, again, one of those kind of core components of me. Um, I, I thought back when I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do, I was like, well, I could teach, but what if you taught teachers? Like, wouldn't you have that much more of an impact if you actually taught people who were then going to go out and, like, spread it more? So that, again, has kind of always been this thing in my head, and how that translated to me was – quickly saying yes to this opportunity through Berkeley to supervise students. Um, And I just, you know, I've been doing that for 20 years now, which is pretty amazing. And what's amazing is I have, you know, four kind of advanced practicum students that just started. I just met them on Friday and I'm still trying to find new ways to help students understand how to be flexible and creative and improvisatory um, in, you know, 10 weeks time for two hours a a shot. So I'm I'm always trying to find new innovative ways to to help students to learn a concept that's really, really big and can be kind of scary. So I like trying to take a complicated idea and find all of the little tiny baby steps that you can kind of set someone up for success and they can see their growth as they go. So I've, I've just always loved that part of it. What are some of your most successful techniques that you've developed? Mm. Well, what I, the idea that I had for this semester, that was kind of this brand new idea that I've never done before. It's, it's really wonderful to think about it because when I went back and listened to some of Stephanie's um, videos that she has posted on her, her website, music for kiddos. I saw her using those components that she learned in her 
P5, um, both in the class and in practicum, I saw her using all of them in the, you know, her songs to kind of control large <laughs> masses of children at one time. And so the, the thing that I had my students do this semester is to introduce the idea of doing a stop and doing a hold or a tremolo as a way to not just sing a song at somebody, but to really create space to let the song have improvis improvisational components to it. So to do a stop both like catches their attention and to do a hold vocally and then to tremolo on the guitar is a way to, again, just do something spontaneous that catches their attention and then you can move on to more um, advanced or tricky cues like slowing down the tempo or, you know, adding a rhythmic cue or something like that. So those are, those are the two basic ones that I teach my students and I was able to give them a new assignment this semester which said, take a song that you love and know really well and sing it once like a chorus of it straight through, just at me. And then try to add a stop and I like show them the technique of like muting the guitar and try to do a hold and I tell them about holding vocally, blah, blah, blah. And then add three each of those into your chorus of your song and see if you can surprise yourself. Don't always do it after a four measure phrase. Don't always, you know, do it at the, like the predictable times. And what was, and then I had them record it and send it to, uh, videotape it and send it to me. And then when they came for their first song workshop on Friday, they were like so much farther beyond than any of the other students that I had taught over the 20 years, because I think I was able to find a really concrete task for them to do. And it felt, it felt like a win. So I was like, yay, 20 years and I'm, I'm still learning how to supervise. <laughs> Yeah, well, good for you for, first of all, taking the initiative to continue to grow how right. you're educating. But also, that's great that you got that feedback early on, that this new idea is working. And right. that's a great example of clinical musicianship that is so simple once you know it and once you've done it. But right. for an 18-year-old or even a 20-year-old who's still in their undergrad, it's like, right. oh, right, that's that's part of what separates this from performance. Exactly. That is the thing that really separated separates it from performance. So that's, a, it's a really great component to introduce. Yeah. So yeah. can I, I want to pick your brain on Stephanie's comment about leading with your voice and how you yeah. taught that. Can you break mm -hmm. that down for us? Um, yeah, absolutely. So I think I say this knowing that I am a vocal primary. So I'm I, I acknowledge my bias here, but I also know that I can do a session without my guitar. I don't need my guitar. And I can still do all of the prompts and cues and take all of the risks and, and lead and follow whether or not I have that instrument. And that's what a lot of people, a lot of my students are like, what? What do you mean? Blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's a... I think it's really important to be able to instill in students the importance of voice as primary instrument and guitar as support for it. And another reason why I say that is because oftentimes the guitar can actually get in the way of a student connecting with the patient if they're doing all these really cool licks and like all this, you know, these fancy inverted color chords and and their focus is there instead of simply using music in its best form for that patient to connect with that patient so if you if you really look at using your voice as that primary point of connection and the guitar really supports it i think you can just move along in your ability to connect with a patient in the moment yeah. And it, it feels so counterintuitive thinking back to my undergraduate training because um, at, I went to Marywood University and we needed four semesters of piano, two semesters of guitar. And we had a, it was a vocal class. I'm not a primary vocalist, but mm. it, we had a vocal class, but it wasn't geared specifically towards clinical 
vocals. Um, it was kind of right. just a little bit of vocal health in there and some singing of songs you should know kind of a thing. But so the mm -hmm. training was so heavily proficiency on piano and guitar that it's right. great that your students have this clinical supervisor who's saying those are awesome skills to have and use them, but also remember that you are your biggest instrument as well. Right. And when you don't have those skills, those proficiencies on the guitar or the piano, whatever it is, then it's, it is a detriment to you because your attention is where your hands are instead of out. So that definitely has to be like there. Um, but then to think about all of the ways that we can use our voice to be able to create this really beautiful, spontaneous experience um, for patients. And I've always loved Bobby McFerrin. Like I've been a fan of Bobby McFerrin since like the dawn of time. So the way he uses his, his voice as an instrument, the way he scats, the way he improvises, riffs on syllables, I use that a lot clinically as well to create these kind of clinical workout sections after you've done your A theme, then you move away from it into like a B section. I'm using a lot of improvised sounds. Um, and, and I think having that confidence and proficiency in my voice as a, as an instrument allows me to do that, which then frees me up from having to do all of those things with the guitar. Yeah. Yeah, totally. You're um, totally right about also being the profici proficiency being important. So your brain mm -hmm. can focus on all the other things. Yeah. Right. And you can, you can inspire melodic ideas with your harmonies that you choose. And if you just stick to one, four, five, you have to push harder to come up with cool melodic ideas when you're kind of in these improvised sections. So again, it's hard for me sometimes to break it down into ways that I can really teach that because I just always had it. I never really had to think about developing my ability to use my voice. So I, again, love the challenge of working with students and like, okay, how can I help this student who does not, who is not a voice principal really use their voice in this um, intentional, authentic, creative, musical way. And it's, it's a challenge sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Especially again, I'm not a vocalist. So right. all of that stuff to me was very unfamiliar. And right. even still, I'm still learning about other right. ways to use my voice and um, incorporate and I think that's, different sounds. That's one of the interesting things about in, um, using a hold or a tremolo is it because you just, you just take any part of a word that you're singing, like it's a bitsy spider. And you just, you're just literally holding. So it doesn't demand a lot from you vocally, but you have to be thinking clinically to know to do that hold. So it's a good baby step in terms of how do you start developing skills on your ability to use your voice as a primary clinical instrument. Yeah. Do you have any other specific examples of that you want to share? Um. Well, one of the things that we talk a lot about when we are looking at this B section part of our song or this clinical workout section is the idea of singing the sounds of the instruments that we're playing. So if, you know, we're jamming on some twinkle and then we go into the, to the B section, which is now like, now shake it, shake it, shake it. Oh, 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 shake it, shake it, shake it. Now bonk. And that's cueing them to use the shaker and hit the drum. And I might just say, bonk. And if they do it, great. And if they don't, I might try it again. Shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it. Now, bonk, bonk. Okay, hit the drum, hit the drum. You know, and I might then add a verbal cue. Um, or another classic cue is when you're on a xylophone and you do zhling to see, like, do they, if I just sing zhling, Will they put that together and kind of do a glissando on the xylophone? And it's amazing to see, like, most of the time, they just get it. Because I was able to just cue it vocally. And really with the guitar, I would just stop. Because I'm not going to, like, slide up like that. That doesn't really, you don't need that. I just cue it. 
with my voice. So, so those are some of the um, first cues that we'll then start teaching our advanced practicum students to get comfortable singing bonk or zhling or la da la da 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 and to just be able to play as a way to kind of cue that we're just kind of jamming together. Yeah, what great examples of um, nonverbal communication as well. Right. Yeah, vocal, yeah, but not works. verbal. Right, exactly. Yeah, oh, I love that. I love that so much. So tell us about your use of self-humor and creativity mm. when creating relationships. Gotcha. So um, whenever I tell people what I do, um, you know, I tell them I'm a music therapist and I always specify, and my specialty is kids. I get kids. I love kids. Um, again, it's where it's one of my greatest strengths is knowing how to just connect with the child, be it someone that I'm, you know, if a friend is bringing their child to meet me for the first time and it's like not in music therapy, or if it is in the hospital inpatient or in the clinic. So again, this is something that I've always loved and have, um, have had as a part of my life forever. So I, and I always preface this with my students. It's like what you, how you see me interacting with kids is a part of my kind of core. So it's okay if you don't have all of these ideas and skills and sillinesses right away. So, um, I think when I'm, when I'm walking into the, into the room of a pediatric patient that's never met me, um, I've got two primary tools. One is myself, and then one is my crate full of awesome stuff. <laughs> um, and I always make sure that when a kid is seeing me for the first time at the door, they can see that I have a guitar in my back and I have this crate of stuff. And sometimes the crate is all they need, and it's like, just come in, I want to, I want to see that stuff and kind of really get right into it. But sometimes they're not ready. The, the crate isn't enough. So then it requires me to really work with what is probably presenting as some resistance or just uncertainty or terror or shyness. You know, it's, it's all different levels. And um, so one of the things that I love to do is to be able to like look into their environment since they're not ready to use kind of my things. I look into their environment and just kind of see what of their comfort items or things that, you know, they've got around them. What can I use to help me create a connection with them? And so again, when I'm trying to teach my students, how do you be funny with kids <laughs> It's a very tricky thing to try to teach someone how to be funny, but I've actually found some steps, I guess, that one can take. And, you know, and, and to some people, this will probably be like, duh, of course, these are all like normal kid things that you would do. But again, when you're trying to synthesize it in a way to teach someone that doesn't have this, it, it helps you kind of clarify. So one thing I do all the time is, is I'm wrong, you know, I'm really ridiculously wrong. Like, so is your name um, Joey or is it Broccoli? Or, you know, do you think my name is um, Horsey or Lori or something like that, where it's just absolutely ridiculous to see if you can crack a smile. Um, or if we're like, got to a place where I'm looking at something that's on their bed Again, I'm trying to kind of be wrong in a ridiculous way. Um, so that's one thing that I'll do a lot. And I think just the ability to kind of talk with the child in a way that is silly and, and ridiculous as a way to help them smile is something that I just love to do. But And another thing that I'll often try is if they have a stuffed animal on their bed, I'll say, oh, could I? could I show you something with this? And if they say yes, then I will make their stuffed animal do absolutely ridiculous things. Like 
um, you know, shake their little shoulders or move their little paws or if I can tie that stuffed animal to an instrument that I have in my crate and make the stuffed animal start to, to do it, um, this is often a huge door opener in terms of the pediatric uh, medical setting world. And again, none of these are like breakthrough techniques, but when you're faced with a kid who's so terrified that they can't connect to the parts of themselves that actually love music, this is where like, there's no holds barred. You just do anything that you can do to try to help that kid remember who they are despite of their illness or accident. Um, and I find that humor is the best way. If you can get a kid to crack a smile, then it makes the door to establishing a working relationship open a little tiny bit. And if I can push it a little more and a little more and a little more, then I'll do it often through humor, um, using instruments as something that they're absolutely not supposed to be. You know, again, that's like, that's the creative component. Um, I purposely have a bag of weird instruments, um, that if a, if a patient is not willing to do music with me, I'll say, do you want to just maybe look at my weird instruments? And again, most of the kids are like very intrigued by weird instruments. So we'll, take them out one by one. And I'll often use these little like hand percussions or my whale castanets or my weiros that I can put an egg shaker on top and make it look like an ice cream cone. Um, I'll, I'll really do kind of creative play, but I've am bridging the, the, the divide between a working relationship and a music relationship by now manipulating these instruments in a funny way. Yeah. Do you have a quack stick in your weird instrument uh, bag? Obviously. <laughs> That's what They're I pictured immediately when you said that. Yes. <laughs> and what's great about the quack sticks and the bird, the, the chirper, the yellow one, is that I have those on the outside of my crate. And so if I accidentally, quote unquote, bonk into them and the, they just hear this quack sound, um, they, are, they think that's hilarious. But here's something to note. I actually don't keep the, the quack stick and the canary stick in my weird instrument bag because I use them all the time. Like every day I use those in some way, shape or form. Not all of my staff use those as much as I do, but I think they're hilarious. <laughs> they are, so, they really are. They really are. I had to so, um, take my quack stick out of my instrument bag because uh, I would actually accidentally put my bag down and in a class of a lot of children it was everything else I had planned was out the door and we would have done the quack stick for 30 minutes and got nothing done so and it's it's not quiet it is a loud instrument (laughs) yes it is that's that's funny when I I did my internship at a a state hospital and Mm. there was one day where the the doctor we were in the nurse's station and he was just having a day and so I went over and I got the quack stick out of our cart and I gave it to him and for the next 10 minutes he just played the quack stick (laughs) and drove all the nurses crazy and I was like this is this is music therapy (laughs) that's hilarious yeah Yeah, and one of my favorite parts about the quack stick is when I have to clean it afterwards and I'm like trying to really quietly like <laughs> mute the sound. And it's like, quack, 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 quack. and I was like, it's just me. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty funny. That's a funny one. <laughs> Do you use a vibra slap too? Um, so I had a, a vibra slap was a part of the instruments that were at the hospital when I got there 16 years ago. Wow. And I quickly got rid of it because I love it. Mm-hmm. And it definitely goes in the weird instrument bag, but it was too loud. Yeah. So I've I've had to filter out a lot of instruments because of their volume. Um, and that was definitely one of them. And like there was like the thunder tube thingy like that is so cool, but it is so loud. So it just didn't make the cut. <laughs> what about the ocean drum? I've heard varying things about the ocean drum. Too loud. Too loud. And I guess they have created this quieter one with the lullaby breath. Um, NICU training that they do they have like a they call it an ocean disc now Um, and I guess that one's quieter but for me it's all just too loud yeah I could see that especially in a hospital setting where the sound environment is not conducive to loud noises uh, right because everything reverberates exactly and you might have a 
patient next door. So you just, you have to be, I mean, and I'm, I'm so thoughtful about how I use drums and when I will introduce a mallet versus not a mallet. Um, and I've learned that I can shove a blanket up inside a frame drum to mute the sound and all these ways to try to let a kid really express themselves on an instrument, but be conscious of the fact that there's someone, if not in the bed right next to them, in the room next to them. So we have to, a lot of what we do is actually uh, guided by our awareness of the sound environment. Yeah. Can you walk us through some more examples of how you've adapted instruments to allow that Mm. expressivity? Oh, yeah. So I think, again, first of all, just not having some instruments in the crate. Like it's, again, I've been doing this for 20 years, so I've really come to learn instruments that don't work. Um, And I love, so I love having drums. Um, so I have two frame drums and two tambourines, all that stack inside of each other so that it's just all fit. I think the biggest one is maybe 10 inches. I think it goes 10 and then eight and then six and then four. So 10 and eight are the two frame drums and then six and four are the tambourines. So the tambourines are pretty little, or maybe it's bumped up one and it's 12 and 10 and eight and six. I don't remember. Um, so I don't have really, really big drums. All of those instruments, again, I can kind of introduce a blanket underneath. Um, I love using an electronic drum set. So I have a little Yamaha four head electronic drum set that I have an actual volume button on. So that that one's pretty cool. Although, of course, I have to remind kids about a bazillion times a session like, oh, we can only, you know, bring the the volume to this point. Um, There are certain pianos like little tiny baby Casio keyboards that I'll have in the crate that again have a really good volume control where it's actually a slider not a like you have to some keyboards will come on full volume all the time and you always have to turn them down that doesn't work for me Mm. um and for my setting um so i love a i love a good xylophone and a good glockenspiel but i am very picky about what kinds of mallets i use with them to make sure they're not too hard Um, so there's better mallets that you can pick for the bells, um, for the jingle bells. I actually won't use like, if it's a full jingle bell stick with lots of little ones, I always have to check it first to make sure the, the, the jingle bells aren't too loud. So usually I'll use just the single jingle bell on it. Um, I don't ever use big maracas cause they're too loud. So I'll either use the chiquitas or the little, uh, shaker eggs. Um, and that bag of weird instruments that has probably had to have the most thoughtful sound editing um, is when I'm buying instruments for that weird instrument bag because I want them to be, I want to have a wide variety. I want to have really little ones. I want to have big ones. Um, But those big ones can't be like the vibra-slap where they make too loud of sounds. So it's really just trial and error. Um, And then if things don't work for me, I will move them on to other music therapists that don't have my um, kind of more limited sound environment needs. Yeah, those are all really helpful. Thank you. Is there anything you adapt in the environment to kind of help the sound? Mm, I close the door. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I close the door all the time. Um, So that's kind of a, a habit that I've just gotten into is trying to be thoughtful about that. Although of course some staff really like to hear it. So they'll then open the door, (laughs) which is great. I love this too. Um, And again, in terms of the, going back to the whole idea of leading with the voice, I'm always very aware of how loud my guitar is because it does not need to be very loud. You're working usually one-on-one or one-on-two or three. So you know, your, my ability to use the guitar. I don't actually ever use a pick in the hospital, um, because of volume. And also, I don't know, I just, I'm not really great at using a pick, but that is definitely an adjustment that I will have my students think about. I'm like, if you're going to use a pick, you need to be able to control the volume really well. Um, and then let's see, I think those are, those are pretty much the biggest, um, adjustments that I make. Yeah. 
Those are also really, really practical. Lots of Mm -hmm. really good practical advice in this episode. (laughs) Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Is there anything else you want to tell us about, discuss before we Mm. go into rapid fire? Well, let me think about that for a second. Go for it. I think for me, one of the reasons why I'm still a music therapist after 20 years and still love being a music therapist after 20 years is that I really love the population that I work with and I really love my setting and I really love my team and have worked really hard to make sure that all three of those different components throughout the, you know, my 20 years, um, continues to kind of serve me. So I think that's, if there's anything that you can do within your practice, if something's not feeling right and you can make tiny tweaks um, here or there to either make your environment better or to um, maybe there's another type of population you can add into the work that you do, or if you can develop a team and maybe you, you aren't as lucky as I am to have a team right within your setting of music therapists, but then to think about who else could you consider as a part of your team? And is it uh, another healthcare professional, OT, PT speech, or is it, um, you know, a social worker, or is it another, you know, rec therapist, or whoever you can kind of meet with on a regular basis to just connect with as a professional I think those three components have been really important to me over the last 20 years. Yeah, creating a support system can be really difficult um, Mm -hmm. depending on your setting. So that's awesome that you've been able to grow that and develop it. Totally. In the beginning, you also mentioned, um, you said your population, your team, and you also mentioned self-care. So how do you do daily, weekly, monthly self-care to keep yourself energized and and in, in it, in the hard, hard days yeah hard times it's such an important question and I mean everyone should ask this question of themselves like every day because I know I'm not great at doing the self-care every day and um, I'm looking at my my meditation cushion over on the other side of my room right now and and when I can I get there um And every time that I can't, I work on not judging myself for not being able to get there. So I think that actually is a big component of self-care is being okay if you aren't a perfect self-care guru. Um, So I think that's number one is just keep trying every day. If you don't have a great self-care day on that day, then try again. Um, So that's the first thing. And then I, I really try to have as many different kinds of, um, outlets for myself. Um, and my newest thing that I've started is just trying to find more community that is not music therapy based. Um, so I joined a book club and again, I took these quilting classes and it's just so nice to have other groups of people that are all sharing um, something in common. And it really doesn't matter what it is as long as you get some enjoyment from it. So I think that even, I mean, there's always taking care of your body and drinking water and trying to eat as well as you can. But these self-care practices that have been tied to community have probably given me the most bang for my buck. Well said. And I'm glad you mentioned... um money bang for your buck because sometimes it is an investment in yourself it is absolutely and and it's so it's really thinking about what what can give you the most value over the long term yeah well said well said thank you are you ready for the rapid fire questions i am bring it on awesome the questions are short but your answers don't have to be okay the first one is coffee or tea It should be tea, but it's currently coffee. (laughs) No shoulds, just a question. (laughs) Okay, fair enough. Coffee's good for you. It's a good um, diuretic. I I don't like the aftertaste, though. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of it, but it's like I I drink it because it smells good. Really, that's why I drink coffee. Got to get you like an essential oil. Is there a coffee essential oil? Is that a thing? (laughs) I'm I'm not sure, but I'm intrigued by it. 
I'll have to look it up. Early bird or night owl? Early bird, for sure. Watching the sun come up is one of my favorite times of day. Mm, and it's getting earlier, finally, it up is. here in New England. It is. And all the birds are singing, and it's just, I love that time of day. Mm -hmm. Something you would tell your younger self? Um, be kinder to yourself. Give yourself a break. It's okay to not be perfect. Mm. Yeah. Your music therapy elevator speech. Um, so we use music um, to find ways to help patients kind of connect to the parts of themselves that are well. And we do that by kind of quickly assessing their connection to music um, their preferences, and then we see if we can use all different types of music to help them work on their goals for wellness or rehabilitation. I like that. I like that Thank a lot. You. Your favorite self-care practice? Right now, I would have to say working at the sewing machine. Really loving that. It's like a combo of colors and puzzles and math and and you just don't exactly know how it's going to look when it's all done so there's that spontaneity too totally i love being able to use the sewing machine to fix my own clothes and things oh, that just like yeah. gives me so much empowerment <laughs> even if it's Definitely. really simple Definitely. absolutely no that's awesome something that's currently adding value to your life um Riding my bike. Yeah. That is one of my favorite ways to get to and from work. So it's a value because I don't have to pay for the tea. And um, I get to be outside. And it's just, it's like the best way to begin and end my day. And I ride all along the Charles River. So it's, I'm very lucky. And that, that, that is my route. So it adds a lot of value. Do you have to change your clothes because of like the mud that gets sprayed up? <laughs> well, it's not so much the mud. It's the um, workout component that I need to shift into. <laughs> and I have a road bike and I like to go fast. So I, I, I like to work up a sweat. But so, yeah, I, I have my little backpack with my outfit on and have my boots under my desk. <laughs> Perfect. Your favorite intervention or song to use in a session? Hmm. Um, my favorite intervention, I think, is doing a clinical lesson on um, a ukulele. I love using the ukulele as a tool for patients to see um, the potential of a whole new leisure activity. That's a whole yeah. other topic that we should dive totally. into in the future. Any day, bring awesome. it on. Awesome. <laughs> I'll, I'll reach out to you about that. Um, okay. Hit my desk here, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So lastly, where can the listeners find you and connect with you? That is a great question. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to include my email if people have questions. Um, yeah. We do have, if you Google MGH Music Therapy, we have a couple of different websites, both that are cancer center based and um, the, the children's hospital within MGH is called Mass General Hospital for Children. And we've got a great video on that website as to um, what music therapy is and what it looks like at MGH. So those two different websites. Um, and in the cancer center, we're a part of the Catherine A. Gallagher Integrative Therapies Program. So it's music therapy, art therapy. Those are my two programs that I manage acupuncture, massage, yoga, tai chi, qigong awesome. um, are part of my, my uh, co-directors programs. So they can also look up music therapy under the auspice of integrative therapies as opposed to Mass General Hospital for Children. And I can send you those links. Awesome. How progressive. Right? Even though those are very ancient practices, but it's exactly, awesome but to hear that they're no, being incorporated. They are. And um, we're very lucky in the Cancer Center at Mass General Hospital that they are so inclusive of integrative therapies and have become such a big part of the patient care services that we offer um, all of our cancer patients from pediatrics through um, adult. 
Yeah. Oh, it sounds like such a great place. Like you said, all the no, no doors are closed for you. Right. You can try all the possibilities. That's so wonderful. And a real great example for anyone out there who is not in a setting like that, but they do exist. Right. And, and we are not, we're not hospital funded. We are funded a hundred percent through philanthropy. So it's still, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's still a lot of work for our uh, development team to get funding for our program, but we have such great stories and great statistics and um, great patient outcomes that think thankfully it's been happening for, you know, over 16 years. Awesome. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing all your practical advice and for making the time to be on the show. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. Have a wonderful rest of your nice sunny day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So much great practical advice in that conversation. Thank you so much, Lori, for sharing your 20 years worth of experience with really refining instrument usage and your teaching. I hope that there are more of you out there who are not as innate with the things she said, because I know for me, having those things broken down is really nice sometimes because yeah, I'll give silly answers or use stuffed animals in a session too, but to have the validation and the affirmation that those are really great ways to make a connection with a client is great. So hope you learned a lot, lots of takeaways in that episode. Again, check out our Facebook group, Music Therapy Chronicles on Facebook, uh, and join our poll for the 50th episode. What do you guys want to see? What should we do that's extra special for that 50th episode? You can also find us on Instagram at Music Therapy Chronicles. And if you or someone you know is interested in being on the podcast, please email feedback at musictherapychronicles.com. This show isn't possible without the guests. So please consider being on the show. I think that everyone has something to share. And I'd love to hear what you are up to, what you're learning, what you're researching, what you're experiencing. Share your expertise. Um, you get great listener feedback about all of the episodes. So whatever you have to say will reach the right people that need to hear your message. And finally, if you are looking for a way to support the podcast, or if you want the exclusive opportunity to ask guest questions, then check us out on patreon.com. The link is always in the show notes and you can become a patron. So That's it for this week's episode, and I will see you in the next one.